Howdy folks, thanks for joining me, Justin here with uh, Elder Scrolls Legends, currently rank 1 legend myself. Um, before we get into a game here, I had somebody ask me about crafting this deck, um, what legendaries they should be looking at, um, crafting first. My personal recommendation would be to look first at the legendaries which can be used in other decks. Um, cards that are not going to be just shoehorned into this strategy, right? So on that note, we have Nahagliv, which uh, the 7-7 guard dragon that can't be targeted by my opponent's actions. Uh, I feel like this card goes in a lot of decks running purple. Uh, it's a very solid card. Um, just good, good cost to uh, stat balance, and I think that it was uh, it's a pretty good place to start. Um, on that same note. If you're interested in playing Archer, which is one of the most popular decks on the ladder right now, um, Tazcad fits into that deck nicely, and I would I would personally put Tazcad in almost every green deck I ran, even if he's the only card that costs more than six. You know, uh, he's that strong. You know, in this deck, it usually functions as an eight mana removal spell, but you can also look at it as a uh, you know ten power uh, worth of attack charge creature. Um, that uh, any deck would like to run. Um, so Tazcad's a good place to start as well. Um, Ungulum, the listener, is interesting. I'm not... Uh, I hesitate to just recommend that you go out and craft an Ungulum, the listener, um, because I'm sort of torn on how good the card is. Uh, any card that wouldn't mind a Mud Crab, you know, a 2-1 creature that doesn't do anything else, um, that could find a use for that, um, should invest in an Ungulum, uh, because, you know, he brings his assassinating friends along, but, you know, it's not the kind of card that is usually going to win or lose games for you, and it's certainly not the kind of card that you should depend on to do anything at all for you. That said, if you open an Ungulum uh, in, in a pack that you uh, get as a reward or from Arena or something like that, then he is definitely, you know, an easy sl slam into the deck. Uh, Black Marsh Warden is a really useful card in both this archetype and in uh, the sort of mostly purple mid-range decks that run Gloom Wraith and Stalwart Ally. And he's also, or she's also, really good in the Spell Sword Tokens decks. Uh, I don't think a lot of people have been running her in Spell Sword Tokens, but I think because the game has only been in open beta for a few weeks, a lot of players don't have them yet, it being a sort of... Uh, not very flashy legendary, but if another deck you want to run is Spell Sword Tokens, I would encourage Black Marsh Warden to be one of your first creations for this deck. Uh, Blood Magic Lord, you know, you get one of these at level 50, uh, so keep that in mind when crafting parts for this deck, but I think it's one of the most powerful cards in the deck. Uh, you certainly can't depend on drawing any particular Blood Magic spell, but they're all useful and uh, if you position yourself in a, in a way that any of them is going to help you out, um, it's a great card to have. I wouldn't recommend crafting it, though, because I don't know that it's played in any other deck. Um, I think the Spell Sword Control decks tend to run the yellow uh, legendaries like Manticora and... I'm sorry, Manticora is epic, but uh, Manticora and Maroc, so they might not be as interested in the Blood Magic Lord. Red Brahmin, you can get Red Brahmin from your level up legendary rewards at like level 36 or 32 or something like that. Um, so if you're running the Scout Avatar, or the Argonian Avatar, I mean, um, you have a pretty good chance of pulling one of those then. I would recommend that uh, you not craft Red Brahmin. He is only usable in, in this deck. Um, it's a really clutch card in a lot of matches, but if you're limited on resources, Red Brahmin is one of the last cards I'd craft. And Iron Atronach, um, I like Iron Atronach a lot, personally, but in a lot of situations, um, you can run Odiving, I think that's his name, the 12 cost neutral card, the dragon that's 10-10, does 4 to your opponent's board, um, with just as much success. I personally prefer the Atronach because uh, I'm trying to shore up the mage matchups, but I wouldn't uh, go out of your way to craft one necessarily. 
especially if you have an Odaving, that's a fine run uh, in its place. You know, I didn't even run Iron Atronach for the longest time personally. My curve capped off at Red Brahmin, and I had... I don't even remember. Some other small creature in that spot. I have been impressed with it, but I think it's the least important legendary to craft for the deck. So anyway, that's just a brief look at the legendary cards in the deck and what you might want to craft in what order. While we're on the subject of the card selection, I'll just go over a few things here. Deadly Draugr um, is uh, the only one drop besides Zongolem in the deck, and uh, you know it's easy to go back and forth on whether or not this card is worth including at all. Obviously, it uh, eats removal from archers all day long, although I found the archer matchup to be pretty favorable um, once you get a handle on the scout deck. But what I like about Deadly Draugr is that uh, it is, in my opinion, the least awful one-drop that you can top deck after turn one, right? 1-1 uh, one, one lethal, if it doesn't eat a removal spell, is going to trade with something, unless it's a warded creature. And you can really do a good job of funneling your opponent's creatures into certain lanes uh, early in the game by using cards like Deadly Draugr and Fighter Skilled Recruit. Uh, you may also you may have noticed that this deck doesn't really run a lot of prophecy cards, Fighter Skilled Recruit being the only one that is going to really dramatically impact the game when it comes down. I mean, Mummify, of course, at the right time can be totally clutch, but if we're only running two of them, I wouldn't really depend on it. And to be honest with you, most of the time, Mummify is used to remove it opposing guard creatures. But Fighters Guild Recruit and Deadly Draugr do a good job of putting your opponent's creatures into the lanes you want them to be in at the beginning of the game. Uh, Murkwater Witch is a really, really important card in this deck. Um, obviously on turn 7 it combines with Leaf Lurker to kill any opposing creature. It does a great job of sniping off the one toughness ward creatures like the Breton Conjurer and it shuts down opposing fighters guild recruits it uh... it's easy to get a lot of mileage out of this it's part of the reason why the one four lethal that gains you a magical when you kill a creature with it is uh... not where i want to be with this deck anymore i was running it for a long time but i took it out because of the murkwater witches in the archer mat that the archer deck is running i feel like Mur murkwater witch also does a great job of shutting down your opponent's early drops and positioning creatures into the lanes you want them to be in. Um, it's not uncommon to, against aggro decks, get a two for one with Murkwater Witch. His speaker is probably the worst card in the deck. Um, I just personally found that in really aggressive matchups, I just wanted something to drop on turn two that I could use to trade off with my opponent's creatures. Um, his speaker fills that role while sort of accelerating the overall game plan of the deck, which is to drop gigantic minions onto the board. Uh, I only run two of them. I haven't personally found anything I want to run more. I've tried a few other cards, but I feel like until different cards are printed in that cost slot, I'm going to continue to run his speaker. Thieves Guild Recruit, one of the best cards in the deck. Uh, I would run it if it didn't have the discount text. Uh, just drawing a card um, and getting a 1-2 into play is great in the beginning of the game. You're just looking to uh, clog up the board and damage opposing minions with that thing. It's good against aggro. And uh, it, continuing to uh, draw the cards that you're actually looking for is important against the control decks and the mid-range matchups as well. Wind Keep Spell Sword is a high-value creature. You shouldn't really struggle to get a 2-for-1 with this thing. Trades well with opposing Fighter Skilled Recruits, obviously. And... Uh, just another really solid early drop. Just something that gets us to where we're dropping these huge bombs. Crushing Blows is my personal vote for most powerful card in the game. <laughs> Certainly my favorite card in the game. It's just really, really useful. Uh, costs the perfect amount, perfect amount of magicka. And if you look at the creatures in the game, there's a whole lot of things that cost three magic, or that have, I'm sorry, that have three toughness that removing on turn two, three, or four is essential for. Keep in mind, you can also trigger Leaf Lurker, it's good for moving opposing wards if you are into that sort of thing. And of course, you can close out the game with it by dealing 3 damage to your opponent's face at the right moment. I already touched on Mummify a little bit. This is uh, a powerful card that, if you're playing the deck well, isn't going to be necessary most of the time. It's unlikely to win you the game when it gets revealed by Prophecy. I frequently just drag it to my hand when it's revealed by Prophecy. Um, 
But there are definitely situations where it is your only answer and you need that sort of answer. Tree Minder, great card, very simple. Gain one match, max magicka. This allows you to do things like turn three Tree Minder into turn four Thorn Hist Mage and really get the acceleration going. And then, and of course, the one one guard ability is nothing to be scoffed at. Uh, clogging up lanes with this guy is a great way to get you to the later part of the game. I right, touched on Black Marsh Warden a little bit. This card is amazing. Um, left unanswered, the value it provides is insane. Um, getting one three three token, you're already getting five. Uh, power for four magicka, which is a good deal, and two turns of uh, triggering will get you a lot of value. Preserve of the Roots, incredibly undercosted. Even as a 4 4 4 4, it's not bad. Uh, it's important to have these sorts of bodies around turn four to trade with the opposing minions. Um, you should be able to kill just about anything your opponent drops up until turn four with the Preserver of the Root and leave the Preserver of the Root alive. And then obviously, once you get 7 Magicka, a 6-6 six, six guard for 4 is fantastic value. Leaf Lurker, one of the best green cards in the game, can kill anything, including creatures that can't be targeted otherwise. Um, even warded creatures if they've been damaged by Murkwater Witch or Charis Reaper. Shadowfin Priest, super flexible answer to a lot of things. Uh, you know, first started running it because the ability to neutralize a lot of the support cards against the tokens decks is pretty clutch but um, you know 5-5 five, five, or 4-4 four, four for 5 is not bad on its own and there's generally always going to be something to silence uh, don't forget that you can destroy the opposing magicka elixir if your opponent's playing control and slow rolling you or something like that Born his mage great card uh, don't forget too that uh, as its magicka as your magicka increases, its power increases, and it's not unreasonable to look at this as another way to win the game. Um, you know, you get the power up to 5, 6, or 7, and you're looking at a significant threat that also defends your life total and advances your magicka. It's just a really flexible, useful card. And the 5 toughness is pretty great, too. If you manage to accelerate into this thing, drop in the shadow lane, you can really limit your, opposing, uh, your opponent's options. Karas Reaper, uh, fantastic card in my opinion. There are going to be a lot of situations around turn 7 where when you drop this thing you're just outright killing a creature that's been damaged or just one of the v number of one toughness creatures that are out there, one health creatures. 5-4 body is respectable and um, triggers Leaf Lurker. And just something I like to play uh, to you know impact an entire opposing lane. Um, obviously fantastic in the tokens matchup. And uh, really, you can get value out of this card in any number of situations. Naha Gleave, I mentioned already, uh, just very solid all-around card for what it does. Great against Mage. <coughs> Tazcad, touched on that already. Eight Magicka removal spell is how I like to look at it. Um, not unreasonable to win the game with one of these either. Blood Magic Lord, very flexible, um, high-impact card. I prefer this to the Night Talon Lord because I want my spells to do something even if it gets destroyed right away. Uh, so the Blood Magic spell you're left with is something that is going to allow you to move forward in the game even if your Blood Magic Lord dies. Um, it's a guaranteed 2 for 1 at least. Red Brahmin, super flexible. Uh, good way to shut down opposing guards, obviously, if you're pushing for lethal, but also just a great way to regain control of an entire lane, um, giving you both a turn to do so and removing any pesky in, you know, enhancements that have been given. And then Iron Atronach which might as well have the ability to summon your opponent concedes the game because I can't tell you how many times I played this card and my opponent said, you know, buy the Agafine Battle or whatever, and it's over. So, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at the card choices in this deck, and um, I hope you join me next time when we play some more ladder with it. Thank you very much.